So Pac-12 basketball NBA draft recap. Not an incredible year for the Conference of Champions. I'm sure Bill Walton would be just absolutely livid that there were not more players selected. Uh, Johnny Juzang, most notably among them, went undrafted. Uh, we'll get to his teammate Peyton Watson here in a sec, but uh, we'll, we'll go in order here. There were six players altogether who were drafted. And Johnny Juzang, by the way, did sign a two-way deal with the Utah Jazz, the former UCLA Bruin who led them to the Final Four in the 2020-2021 season and then to the, I think they got Sweet 16 or Elite Eight, one of the two. I think it was Sweet 16. This year, uh, lost, lost to North Carolina. Yes, yeah, so that would have been Sweet 16. Um Benedict Matherin went number six to the Indiana Pacers. It was pretty clear going into the draft that he was going to be the top player selected from the conference. Because if you watch the conference this year, and if you watch March Madness as well, it was pretty obvious that Benedict Matherin was just about always the best player on the court. And he's a lot taller than you think. He's taken uh, with the number six overall pick to the Indiana Pacers. And then uh, Dalen Terry was the next pick. His teammate at Arizona, he goes number 18 to the Bulls. Felt like that was a little bit of a reach. Um, and then Peyton Watson is the 30th pick in the draft to the Oklahoma City Thunder, who had three first-round picks. Uh, Chet Holmgren and Jalen Williams from the West Coast Conference, Gonzaga and Santa Clara, respectively. Got to shout out my alma mater there. Go Broncos. And I know Jalen Williams. He's a great guy and a really, really good player as well. Uh, but Peyton Watson goes to OKC. Christian Coloco, 33rd overall to the Toronto Raptors. He gets to go up to Canada for a while. Isaiah Mobley joins his brother Evan, which is pretty cool, in Cleveland with the Cavaliers. And then the last Pac-12 player selected uh, out of the school uh, out there in Boulder, Jabari Walker, former Colorado Buffalo, goes number 57 to my beloved Portland Trailblazers, um, who took Shaden Sharp with the number seven overall pick. And we'll see. I just I don't have that many hopes for the Blazers. <laughs> it's just it's a it's a it's a dark it's a dark time to be a Pacific Northwest sports fan right now. But anyway, so we're gonna go through who's got the highest ceiling, what the best value pick is here, the best potential steal, and then the biggest question mark, right? Of the six picks, who gets each of those four tiles? Highest ceiling, this is an easy one. Benedict Matherin. He is really good. He can score at all three levels. He is freakishly athletic, has high potential at the defensive end. And I mean, just a basketball player, right? He can handle the ball a lot. I think you can put him on the wing and play him as a big two. I think he could play as a three. I'm going to look up how, how, how tall he is exactly. But, you know, he, he he's just a guy who just pops off of the screen. He's six foot five, so could maybe play a small ball three. I think he's, you know, kind of a hybrid one or two. Uh, you know, speaking of the Portland Trailblazers, I think he's an athletic CJ McCollum. I think he's going to score a lot of points. He can be a ball handler but doesn't have to be at all times, can play off the ball because he can score at all three levels. He finishes at the rim very, very well, which is easy to do when you're 6'5", and you can jump out of the gym with uh, with springboards down there in your shoes. It makes it a little bit easier. So um, I, I think he's got the total package. I think this is a good pick by the Pacers because they need playmakers, and I, I think he's fairly NBA-ready, but like most guys nowadays who are coming out after one year of college basketball, you're going to need some time to fully develop and hit your ceiling. But I, I think that he was the clear-cut top selection out of the conference, and uh, there's no no questioning that pick there at number six from the Pacers. The best value pick, I think, is his teammate Christian Coloco going to the Raptors. Now, he needs to develop an offensive game. He is not a refined offensive player, but his size and athleticism and presence at the defensive end. I think early in his career, he could very easily be a backup big who's defensively oriented. And there's always, 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 always a place for that in the NBA. Think of JaVale McGee on the Warriors, right? He was there for I think three of their championship rings maybe I don't he was not on this most recent team I don't believe but he, he was on the two with Kevin Durant and the one where they got to the finals in 2019 Durant and uh Clay Thompson of course got hurt there's always room for for bigs who who are willing to come in and defend and who are capable of doing so and his athleticism much like Matherin's pops off the television screen he, he is prolific in that sense and if he can refine his offensive game a little bit I think he'll carve out more of a role from a role for himself but I think that right now that's you know kind of what's limiting his uh his total upside 
in the NBA. I'm going to pull up his offensive stats here. Um, you know, it, it's not that he he can't score at all, but you know, he he's definitely. I mean, he's seven one, two hundred and thirty pounds, just a a, a a ridiculous, ridiculous athlete. And you know, I I think that when you watch him play, you just kind of always know where he is. And he's he's a three year player at Arizona. And, you know, did average 12 and a half points a game, seven boards and uh, almost three blocks per contest this year. So making his money, the defensive end and rebounding and just quite the physical specimen. I think if you can find somebody who can be a, a, an immediate rotational player, essentially right away with uh, the 33rd pick. I think that's why it's, you know, kind of the, the best value when you're looking at the six guys who were taken out of the Pac-12 conference this year. The best potential steal of these guys is Jabari Walker, and here's why. Jabari Walker is a well-rounded power forward, and he plays at a position on a team that doesn't really have an established power forward at this point in time. Now, the Blazers did just acquire Jeremy Grant, which, solid move, not bad. But whether or not they're going to play him at the three or the four remains to be seen, right? They could go Dame... Anthony Simons, Josh Hart at the three, Jeremy Grant at the four, and Nurkic at the five, in which case Walker would be coming off the bench, and he joins another former Pac-12 player, C.J. Ellaby, who has struggled to crack the rotation consistently. He's just not been able to, to really put it all together. He's really only gotten in, in in garbage time. But I think when you look at a guy like Walker, the, the reason I say it's the best potential steal is if he's someone who, who can pop, and, and Jay Bills was very, very high on, on that draft pick by by the Blazers there late in the second round. I think it was the second or third to last player selected in the league, number 57. And I'm pretty sure there were, I think there were 59 picks this year because somebody lost one because of a penalty or some such. Because um, I think I saw that he was the second to last pick in, in the draft. So there might have only been 50, whatever the case may be. Late, late second round. Positionally, the opportunity is there for him to show what he can do and I, I think he does a lot of things very well he was i think a 14 point a game scorer this year seven boards and just you know you watch him play and you go yeah that, that that's an nba body and so if he's able to, to pop i think he'll get that opportunity whereas some guys get drafted and they never really get the chance to see the floor because they have too many guys in front of them but the front court particularly the the three and four slots for the blazers been a revolving door of guys over the years and he has the opportunity potentially to step in and and take that role though I, I wouldn't necessarily expect it i also wouldn't be that surprised if it if it ends up happening and you know he at least carves out a, a role for himself in the blazers rotation the biggest question mark here and, and this this was a surprise to me is peyton watson now peyton watson came to ucla this year as a big time five star recruit but was never the guy. And this is just such a strange thing about the NBA is they're so willing, even more so than the NFL, because guys can just go one and done in college basketball. Whereas in college football, you have to play for at least three seasons, regardless of position, or at least be on campus for, for three seasons. The NBA is so willing. Those teams are, are more than willing to take a guy with the physical gifts, but hasn't shown the potential to, to be an elite player and try and develop him. It's it's not about a rapid turnaround with draft picks in the NBA. It's more about playing the long game and playing the development game. And that's clearly what Oklahoma City is doing here, I, I think, with all three of their draft picks, right? Chet Holmgren needs to put on some weight, needs to learn how to be more physical, and we'll have some major adjustments when we talk about going from the WCC to the NBA. Jalen Williams, the same, though he doesn't need to put on any weight. He's got an NBA body, 6'6", 7'2", wingspan. He's a really good athlete as well, great defender. But I think they're playing the long game here. And you look at the status of their franchise, that's clearly the case. And I think that's what they're doing here with Peyton Watson, who this year, remember, this is now a first-round NBA draft pick, or the 30th pick in, in the draft, which I think was in the... Whatever, I don't need to go back into that. 3.3 points a game, just under three rebounds a game. And he came off the bench in 32 games for the Bruins. Now, he was a big-time recruit, but 
that's such a minimal amount of production. Not even three and a half points a game. And he was taken with the 30th pick in the NBA draft. To me, when I saw that selection, I thought Shabazz Muhammad, who was a big-time five-star recruit, who went to UCLA, who went to the Timberwolves, and it didn't pan out. And it just... He never fully lived up to the hype and expectations that were there. And not everybody does. There's so many factors in play when you're talking about a guy realizing his full potential as a professional in any sport. But this pick was just puzzling. And I think OKC is, you know, in a position where they're able to wait and see if he's able to develop. But... That that's a big if I'm talking about the biggest question mark amongst these guys, that's the easy solution. That's the easy answer because he's just barely played. He hasn't shown that he could be a regular rotation player who produces at a high level in power five college basketball. And you're now taking him with the expectation he could become that or maybe even more in the NBA. That's weird and, and feels a little bit like a reach. But on the flip side of the coin, right, the glass half full side of me is saying a lot of guys come out of high school and they're ready to go to the league. Kobe was, LeBron was, Kevin Garnett was. I think we can all agree, you know, players like Zion Williamson didn't need to go to Duke to be ready for the league, though he needed to do other things to get ready for the league, like get in shape. But that that that's the biggest question mark there easily rooting for all these guys and obviously the most fun draft pick is Isaiah Mobley going to play with his brother i mean they go to college together and play and then Evan is really good with the Cavs now Isaiah is there um you know Evan's more talented of the two by by a decent amount but Isaiah could could certainly crack the rotation and i'm sure there'll be a moment this year where they're both on, on the court together and i think that'd be a, a really really cool moment so we'll, we'll end it there with a, a sense of optimism going forward i appreciate everyone listening i will see you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day